Alex Wenner joins me this week to discuss his experience starting a craft brewery. This is Beersmith Podcast number 279. This is Beersmith Podcast number 279, and it's mid-April 2023. Alex Wenner joins me this week to discuss his experience starting a craft brewery. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. Beersmith is the world's most popular brewing software to support your beer brewing and has advanced features used by craft breweries worldwide. Available in both desktop and web-based format, you can build recipes from your computer, tablet, or phone. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com or give Beersmith Web a try by setting up a free account at BeersmithRecipes.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Alex Winter. Alex is CEO and co-founder of Lasting Joy in the Hudson Valley. Alex previous work, previously worked at Cricket Hill, Six Point, and Coney Island while earning his degree from the Sasebo Institute. Uh, Alex co-founded Lasting Joy with his wife to create a craft brewing experience that's more inviting and inclusive. Alex, it's great to have you back on, have you on the show. Actually, as a first-time guest today. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So how, how, are you, how are you doing there? How are things up in the uh, Hudson Valley? They're, they're pretty good. You know, we're ramping up, getting ready for what will hopefully be a nice summer. Um, you know, it's very seasonal around here. Is it? So, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes to sit outside at the picnic tables in the winter? Uh, this winter, you probably could have gotten away with it. It was yeah. a pretty mild winter. But for the most part, no, it's uh, <laughs> spring, summer. And, and uh, honestly, we do just as well in the fall as we do in the summer because of uh, all the leaf peepers and all that. Yeah, it's beautiful up there in the fall. I, I grew up in New York, upstate New mm-hmm. York. So, um, well, it's, tell it's us a beautiful area. Oh, it is absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I grew up in Rochester. Um, so, tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, you spent, I, I guess, over a decade working in New York breweries, uh, mainly around New York City. I think, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, like a lot of uh, people these days, I, I started just home brewing, um, and I, I brewed out of my apartment um, in Manhattan. And uh, back in those days, the only place to get home brewing supplies was out uh, on Long Island. So I would take a train out to East Northport, Long Island, to a hardware store that sold home brewing supplies. Um, <laughs> what did you start? Uh, oh, this would have been uh, 2004, 2000, wow. yeah. somewhere around then. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I just, you know, kind of got into it. But of course, living in an apartment in Manhattan couldn't really get much past doing some small partial mashes, you know, a lot of a lot of extract brew. Um, and then um, at that time, I was actually still pursuing what was my first career, which was working in the video game industry. Oh, really? Um, You're a video yeah. gamer? Yes. Huge, huge gamer. Um, <laughs> and so after my wife and I got married, we actually moved to California and I started working for a video game company out in the Bay Area, uh-huh. and um, that didn't last very long. Uh, turns out that I hated working in a cubicle, <laughs> and um, I did not like being stuck inside all day, uh, or at least not being active. Right. Um, and the nice part, though, was we lived in the Bay Area, and we were renting a house that had a two-car garage, and I... Uh, I was only about 20 minutes drive from the more beer location um, in the Bay Area. Up near and, uh, Concord, right? Aren't they? Yeah. So <laughs> my home brewing hobby uh, quickly exploded to the point where we couldn't park cars in our in our garage anymore. Um, <laughs> and uh, my cousin was at the time getting his master's degree at Stanford. And so it started out with once me bringing a six pack to uh, their weekend parties and within about a year, I was just showing up with kegs, full kegs every weekend um, for for these parties on campus. Um, probably uh, and, probably very popular, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, but I really just uh, realized I was having a lot more fun 
doing that than I was at work. Uh, and so when my boss at the time came to me and said that someone on the team had to be let go, I put my hand up and said, well, I was actually planning on quitting next week anyway. Um, <laughs> so, uh, left, left that industry. And that's where I, I then, uh, started taking the classes at Siebel, um, starting with online and then I would go in person sometimes. And, um, and it was around that time that I got my first internship at Cricket Hill in, uh, in New Jersey. And I mean, they, the Sable has a great program up there, right? One of the best oh, in the was, country. Yeah, it was great. I learned so much in that time, um, not just about the the science and technology behind brewing, but also their classes on uh, starting your own brewery and the business behind brewing. Um, really, really helped a lot. Um, I think they did a good job of uh, putting the fear of God into me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with the the fact that if you decide to run a brewery, it's it's not it's not a hobby; it's a business. It is a business, uh, yes, uh, and business takes most of your time, I think, right? Yes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it's not all brewing either. No, uh, no, it's uh, I, I definitely took the very long route from uh, hating being in a cubicle to now most of my job is just sitting at the desk again. Wow. Well, um, <laughs> I guess that's, uh, but you're doing something you enjoy at least. Uh, yes. So tell us sure. about, I, I think you worked at three different breweries around New York city, right? Yes. Well, so I worked for Cricket Hill in New Jersey. I worked for six point in Brooklyn. Um, and then after, uh, I left six point, I actually ended up working for Brooklyn homebrew, selling homebrew supplies and teaching classes there for a few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I started working for, uh, Coney Island brewery. Uh, once they opened their location in Coney Island, Brooklyn. Hmm. And when did you uh, finally decide to to move over to your newest your newest venture and launch your own brewery? Uh, well, so it was a few years ago. Um, my previous boss, uh, the head brewer at, at Coney Island, was leaving, and I was interested in in trying for that position. Um, uh, but that kind of prompted a whole discussion between me and my wife about whether or not we really felt like staying in the city long term. I grew up in the city. I love uh, New York City. But by that point, my wife and I have we have four kids. Oh. Uh, and having four kids living in the city was challenging. <laughs> really, really starting to challenge us. Yeah. Um, and was uh, so we, we really were starting to consider leaving the city. And part of that was, well, if we leave, um, we should we should make sure that a part of that is us starting our own thing. That's awesome. Uh, well, what are some of the good and bad things you saw working in the craft beer industry? Um, I mean, uh, the, the good is just for the most part, it is an exceptionally welcoming and and fun community. Um, it's. Un, I think it, unlike a lot of other industries, how much we all like to support each other. Mm-hmm. Um, there's such a great camaraderie between breweries. We all like to see each other succeed. We just we love to hear about other breweries opening and and really doing their own thing and doing it well and making it. It's and we we as an industry are so supportive of each other. If a brewery in the area called me right now and said, we really need 30 pounds of cascade. I'd be like, dude, I'm in the car in five minutes. Just it's, it's that kind of an industry. That's really great uh, to be a part of. Um, But then of course the, the flip side to that is as most craft beer nerds and people in the brewing industry are aware of, of the past few years um, with people, bringing up issues in the industry um, is realizing that a lot of that camaraderie and support definitely only applied to people that look like me, white dudes with beards. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) Um, So I I think that that's something that we need to, as an industry uh, uh, as a whole is be more welcoming to people that are not just already a part of the industry. I think it's, it's a factor of taking something like craft beer, which, has been in its infancy for the most part and has had this kind of punk rock mentality uh, for the past 20 years of just trying to struggle against big beer and trying to to stake our claim in this industry Um, and getting to the point where we can stop being so combative and drop some of like the the gatekeeping that there is as far as being a beer nerd. 
um, and be a little bit more welcoming uh, well, and the, kinder to people. Yeah, one of the things I've been I've been saying for years now is it's a very technical thing, um, mm-hmm. beer brewing. Whereas if you go to wine making, mead making, other things, it's it's a little more artistic. And I think sometimes we get overly focused on the technical. You know? Yes, I honestly, it's one of my favorite things about brewing is is it's such a great marriage between art and science mm-hmm. um and you see people succeeding on both sides uh you know when i taught homebrew classes i would really point out that you can succeed as an artist or you can su- concede succeed as a scientist or you find that middle ground that works for you um you know the example i always use is you got uh sam calgione at dogfish uh full artist right mm-hmm. um just very much tasting ingredients and throwing them into a batch and seeing what happens and very much, you know, going by the emotion and the artistry of it. And then on the flip side, you've got people like Ken Grossman at Sierra Nevada who are just pure technical science. Mm -hmm. And you can do, you can do very well on either end or find that middle ground, but it's such a great marriage of the two. Uh, the, the whole art and science of brewing is, is so much fun to me. Now, you said you started uh, on your own just a couple of years back. What are some of the challenges you saw, especially around COVID in the in the craft beer industry uh, in general and maybe in yours as well? Well, so we were doing construction <laughs> for most of COVID, oh, no. which was horrible. <laughs> bad and, timing. Uh, you know, very, very bad timing. Um, trying to plan the finances of anything through every, you know, the prices fluctuating like they were doing during COVID was in no way fun or enjoyable. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the example that I've used with people was at one point we were negotiating with the company that was going to be doing uh, most of our glycol piping mm-hmm. and they would bid on us uh, piping us a system that was going to be copper that was insulated. Uh, they gave us a quote. We negotiated with them over the course of about a week. They were willing to drop their quote by um, uh, about, a few thousand dollars. Yeah. But of course, over that same week, the price of copper went up. Yeah. So that by negotiating with them, the amount that they'd negotiate, that we negotiated their price down, the price of copper doubled. Oh no. <laughs> so we ended up losing money by trying to negotiate them down. Um, so <laughs> it was, uh, not, not an enjoyable experience. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, luckily we pretty much opened right when, people were really raring to get back out there. So we, we kind of were able to hit the ground running when we opened. So you got going again in uh, what? 2001, I guess, probably. Is that what you opened? Sorry. You said 2001, 2000. I'm sorry. (laughs) 2021. That's what I meant. Uh, No, we actually, so we opened in um, uh, last, last summer, um, the weekend before father's day was our first, uh, our first weekend open. Um, And, uh, yeah, we, we pretty much just that that first weekend was insane. It was really, really great to be a part of, but it was insane. Well, we've touched on this a little bit, but what made you decide to really go on your own and start Lasting Joy? Uh, you'd already worked at several breweries. Was it was it a combination of the family factors or was it uh, other things you were hoping to do with, accomplish for the brewery? Um, a big part of it had to do with. My wife will, you know, readily say that that. I have dragged her and the kids to so many breweries over the years and that a lot of them, like I said, are designed for people that look like me. They can be great experiences for, you know, your, your middle-aged dudes with beards, but are not exactly the most enjoyable places for families to hang out for, um, younger people, older people. It's the, the beer industry as a whole is making amazing beer, but as far as a hospitality industry is very young. Well, it was kind of interesting. I had Randy Mosher on some months back and he was talking about, we were specifically talking about tasting beer and he was talking about how much uh, the environment that you're tasting the beer in actually affects how you perceive the beer. I thought that was very, very interesting uh, uh, that, you know, he said even things like the music and the smells and the foods and the other things that you're enjoying uh, really, really drives how, how you perceive the beer itself. Very much so. And it's, it's the kind of thing of if anyone that, that does beer tasting 
you know, you, you try and set up environments, especially if you ever do like judging for a competition, you know, and it's all about trying to make an environment that is, you know, free of other aromas, that it doesn't have excess noise, that you can actually pay attention to it and all this kind of stuff that we put in such an effort to create a proper tasting environment for something like a competition. Whereas those same people will then open up a brewery where you've got, you know, your dumpster parked right next to the front door. And it's just, <laughs> you're, you're kind of just, you're, you're there. And then you just do something like that without or, thinking yeah. about or the it. music so loud. You can't even hear yeah. yourself think, right? Yep. Or people, you know, uh, a big one that I've noticed and, and it's a, a far easier fix, but, um, you know, servers that are wearing a lot of perfume or cologne, um, things like that, that really can just throw off the entire experience. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, how large is your brewery and uh, how did you go about selecting the equipment you ended up with? So we have a 15 barrel brew house um, and we've got four 15 barrel fermenters and uh, three 10 barrel fooders. Um, we've also just started our fledgling little barrel program. Um, but a big reason behind picking that size is a lot of the people that I know that have gone on to start breweries and, or the breweries that I've worked for breweries that I've been a part of in some way or another. Um, they start very small, you know, mm -hmm. and then within whether you're talking a couple of months or a couple of years, you get to the point where you've outgrown your initial system and now you've got to shut down for a few months because you need to completely replace your brew house and all your tanks and your glycol system and everything. Um, so we started with a 15 barrel system with an eye towards this is the system that's going to last us a nice long while and will be very hard for us to outgrow. We also, our glycol system that we put in uh, is sized. We can double the number of fermenters we've currently got, um, which we're working on right now. We've got sure, new sure. fermenters coming. Um, and, and we definitely had an eye towards trying to make it as, um, as, make it as least disruptive as possible to grow as we do. Hmm. And uh, uh, you're, you're located out in the Hudson Valley. I, you're not be near a major town, right? I don't think. Um, not really. We're about 20 minutes uh, from Kingston, New York, which was the first capital of New York, mm -hmm. uh, but still a, a, a small city. Um, but we're near, we're near Hudson. We're near Poughkeepsie about an hour from Albany. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's definitely, uh, we're, we're full country here. Nice. Uh, you know, that's another part of it is <laughs> my entire brewing career up until this point has been in, uh, in, uh, New York city or New Jersey, um, where it's always been city water and city sewer. Yeah. Uh, here we're, we're on a well and a septic field. So that was a big learning curve. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Did you have some challenges with the water system? Um, uh, we've, we're actually very lucky. Our well is is really good. Um, we have a cold liquor tank and a hot liquor tank. Those are both 30 barrels. So those trickle fill off the well pretty much 24 hours a day. Oh, nice. Um, but the uh, the wastewater has been the, the, the biggest headache for us. Yeah. You generate a lot of water, right? You generate a lot of water. And of course, you can't put anything that's, you know, you... you can't put caustics and acids and all that stuff into a septic field. No, um, no, that would be bad. So we, we have a, a small wastewater treatment plant that has been a real learning curve. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I don't think I talked to another brewery on a septic tank before, or at least not that I can recall. So. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it's, it's definitely its own challenge. I know more about wastewater treatment plants than I ever expected to. Um, <laughs> I mean, what we have is is really just a smaller version of what most most municipalities would have for a wastewater treatment plant. Ours just fits in a shed, um, but it's uh, it's caused some headaches for sure. And I guess it probably pulls the acids and the other caustics out, right? So it we've it basically everything from the brewery goes into our the first tank where it all kind of just evens out. And, and just mixes together between acids, caustics, brewery waste, water. That way it all just kind of becomes one homogenous mix. 
Mm-hmm. And at that point, it gets pumped through a system which actually checks the pH and then will dose it in order to bring the pH to seven. Um, so it'll it'll dose it with a caustic or an acid in order to to adjust the pH mm-hmm. before it goes into another tank where the um, the um, microbes live and and will start to digest uh, digest the waste. And then it passes through a membrane system and then it ends up out in the septic field. <laughs> Um, well, what were some of the other challenges getting the brewery off the ground? I think you mentioned financing was a challenge because, uh, you know, your costs were changing constantly. Financing is going to be a problem for every brewery. I don't think, yeah. you know, it's, it's the kind of thing. It doesn't matter how many times you hear it, whatever you're planning, add 50% and then you plan on it. Yeah. Assuming you're going to add that 50%. And it turns out that that was also wrong. Uh, <laughs> especially when, <laughs> especially going into building in COVID, um, you know, it was. Uh, yeah, I mean, things were insane. I, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he said the the price of like getting a container from China, a single, you know, single one of these little uh, uh, containers that they ship things in, went from like three thousand dollars to thirty thousand dollars at one point. Yes. Yeah, there was there was a lot of that. So the 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 tank that I just mentioned for the wastewater treatment plant, um, it was when we were specking the whole system out was a relatively. You know, I mean, it's not like you get a 6,500 gallon tank off the shelf, but as far as those can, things go, it was a standard item. And then once it t- came time to us to actually order it, uh, the only one we could find was in Turkey. <laughs> um, so it was it was a lot of things like that of just like, OK, this thing is supposed to cost X. We found it for that price, but we're going to pay double that just to ship it here from, <laughs> from Turkey. <laughs> from Turkey. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So it was it was a lot of just that that little stuff that adds up yeah. so quickly. Um, Were you, how, but, how, so how did you finance? Did you self finance? Did you get investors to come in? Did you do a bank? Um, we, so we, we worked with a local bank. I mean, relatively local bank just, um, and, and finance through them and, and, uh, and, and ourselves as well. Uh, just personal financing. Um, so we'll, we'll owe the bank a lot of money for a long time. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I know you guys spent a lot of time designing the space for the brewery and the tap room. We talked about why that's important. Um, but what were your goals here and what were you trying to achieve? Uh, and, and what design did you end up with? So, uh, we worked with, uh, a, a friend of a friend who's an architect. Um, and he was just starting his own firm at the time when we were planning this. Um, so Aaron was, was a, a great person to work with. Um, and what my wife and I went to him with was our idea of we really wanted to make a space that was something different, that was uh, hospitality focused. Um, and we really wanted to take a lot more design cues from the wine industry, the hotel industry, restaurants, um, as far as making something that was that was going to stand out. Um, and a lot of the inspiration for the place ended up just coming from the Hudson Valley itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful part of the country. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. Um, and so we we ended up creating this space that's um, it's very modern. And I like to say that it, it both blends in and stands out uh, in the area, uh, considering it's an area that's full of a lot of, you know, old old buildings old barns and we built something that's very modern and very crisp um but at the same time a lot of the design cues for it came from from the natural landscape uh so it's a lot of natural wood a lot of glass so it's you know inside and outside uh you you feel like you're a part of the landscape um and then a a really cool thing that that aaron came up with was the idea of it's just as much a part of the natural hudson valley landscape to see rusted barns rusted tractors um you know old farm equipment sitting in the middle of a field so we used a lot of uh core 10 steel um which is you know develops a really great patina on it um so it's it's definitely a unique looking building gives you that uh aged look to the roof i Mm -hmm. guess probably yeah uh, we actually, so the core 10 steel wraps some of the exterior walls off the patio. And then we have, uh, louvers that kind of wrap around the, the windows to cut down on the, the afternoon sunlight inside. Nice. And, and how, how was it received? How was the, uh, you know, people enjoy the space? Are they able to bring their families and friends? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's honestly, I've 
one of my favorite things a lot of last summer when I was working in the tasting room was just watching people kind of walk up the path to the building from the parking lot and, and seeing their, their reactions when they stepped inside. Um, it's been really great to, to see people without us having to explain anything, to see them kind of understand what we were going for, having so many people show up with families, with dogs, um, and and just being able to enjoy the, the property that we're on. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let's go into your beer lineup and talk a little sure. about brewing for a minute. Uh, what was your yeah. initial beer lineup, and, and, and how did you pick which beers you were going to produce up front? <laughs> so... The, the, the funny thing was, is, uh, you know, with building through COVID, the plan was to have the brewery building um, finished a few months before the tasting room uh-huh. so that I would have tam- time to, to, to fill up. To actually up. make beer, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did not work out that way. I had about <laughs> three and a half weeks um, before we opened. So not much um, time. So I kind of scrambled to have i think i had four beers ready when we opened out of um our uh nine taps that we have devoted to beer and so (laughs) filled the rest with guest taps um from friends in the industry um you know just just made a lot of phone calls and said what do you have that i could get from you um uh but our, our flagship beers, well, the ones that we ended up starting with, we had our um, our English Beet Stout um, and our Belgian Wit and our Pilsner and our Hazy IPA. Uh-huh. Uh, hazy IPA, because everyone has to have a Hazy IPA these days. It seems it's, that way, it's, yeah. It's the unwritten rule of the brewing industry. Um well, and IPAs, unfortunately, are still still over fifty percent of their craft beer, right? Oh, they they are king. It really doesn't matter what we're doing. Our hazy IPA is pretty much every week our our number one seller. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so I mean, we are a New York State uh, farm brewery, um, which means we're required to use uh, right now. I believe it's sixty percent New York State ingredients. Um, oh wow, we're pretty close to 100% New York state grown ingredients. Um, and so I really wanted to highlight what grows in New York. Um, so that was the, the inspiration behind our English beet stout. Um, New York state grows, I believe it's a third of the country's beets. Hmm. Um, and so I, I I honestly haven't brewed with beets. What do you, what do you get out of the beets? I guess. Well, it depends on how much of the beets you use. Um, so we're not just using it there. We're not just using sugar beets. It's not just, you know, um, like using beet sugar in a, uh, yeah, sugar you know, bomb. In, a, in, a, yeah. in a Belgian triple or something like that. Um, we're, um, we're using, uh, beet juice and some beet puree. Um, and we use it, um, we add just enough that you get the earthiness and the richness from the beets mm-hmm. without getting that distinct beet flavor. Okay. Uh, I know beets are very divisive. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of people are really gung ho about beets. Yeah. Um, but uh, honestly, with that beer, I've really enjoyed being behind the bar, having people notice it and, and ask about it. And the number of people that love beets, but maybe say they don't like stouts or don't like beer at all and they try it and they enjoy it or the number of people that say, I like stouts. I really don't like beets. And I'll just say, just try it and, and seeing them <laughs> maybe change their minds about beets. Uh, mm-hmm. if only for our beer. Um, so I mean the English, uh, English beet stout you're making, I guess it's a, is it English style or, or Irish style or, or what? What's yeah. It yeah. So to? it's, it's it's an English style stout, um, so not not quite as dry as not an dry, Irish yeah. style, and and certainly not hoppy like an American stout. Mm-hmm. Um, so a nice sessionable um, stout that just kind of has that enhanced um, earthiness out of the out of the beets. And it's, I mean, it's kind of interesting. You picked a lot of European styles here: Belgian wit, Pilsner, uh, and so on. Yeah, I I really like I said about the New York farm 
uh, brewery aspect of it. I, my goal is really to make classic beer styles with the, a New York farm twist. Um, if there's something that's being grown on a farm in New York, I'd like to figure out a way of making it into a beer. Um, so we've definitely been playing with, with some fruit. Um, but I also, you know, as we're, 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 developing recipes and developing relationships with the local farms, just finding out what they've got and, and how we can get it and turn it into a beer. Well, can you talk to us a little bit about the New York state ingredients? Um, wh- where are you getting some of the local suppliers? I, I understand they're growing hops a lot in central New York again, right? Yeah, there's, there are uh, some really great hops uh, being grown in New York, which is definitely the trickier one with the current uh, hop trend. Yeah, it's kind of uh, it's kind of funny though because uh, if you go back like two hundred years, they were they were or a hundred years they were growing hops there uh, for a long, long time until it was blended yeah. out. I think, right? In fact, yeah. at one time, I think New York State provided most of the hops for the country. It was it was the premier hop growing state for a while pre prohibition. Yeah, um, and it's honestly it's a it's a great area for growing hops. The tricky thing is a lot of the you know if you buy rhizomes these days, they're all coming from the Pacific Northwest for the most part. Uh, so the hops, it takes time to get them to grow uh, here with just the different humidity levels. So you've, you've got to worry about different, um, uh, there's different challenges to growing hops here um, right. than in the Northwest. So um, It's more arid, I think, there, right? Yeah, it's it's taking a little bit of, of time to, to get the, the varieties, uh, different varieties growing well here. But some of them, I mean, Cascade, loves to grow in new york Hmm. and um especially with the the current trend of um uh, thialized yeasts right um some of the new york state grown cascade is so dense with thial uh precursors really fruity um and it's it's amazing um using some of those the, the new york state cascade with those thialized yeasts you get some really intense fruit flavors hmm. out of uh, and which uh, I've and actually on, had a couple guests on the last uh, few months talking about thialized yeast. Which ones are you using? The so thial? we use um, Cosmic Punch from Omega Cosmic Yeast. Punch, okay. Yeah. Um, that's that's how we do our um, our hazy IPA um, is with the Cosmic Punch. And so on the uh, on the hot side, um, we use only New York State Cascade and New York State Sots. Oh, nice. Um, and the, the sots as well is very, very heavy with those thiol, um, precursors. Um, so before, before the dry hop, our hazy IPA is just cascade and sots, which is not anything I was doing when I was home brewing. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And then yeah. are you using local, local malts and local barley as well? So we, uh, are using a lot of local malt. In fact, our malt, uh, our maltster that we buy, probably over close to 90% of our malt from they are five minutes down the road. Mm -hmm. Um, so I usually just go pick up our malt in my truck. Um, and they malt with hundred percent New York state grown, um, barley, uh, rye, wheat, oats, and corn. Um, and most of it's honestly from inside the Hudson Valley, even, uh, it's very, very local. And then we just had a farm plant, uh, two acres of barley on our front yard uh, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so we'll be able to make some beers with, uh, with barley grown on our property uh, in the fall. That's awesome. And you have, uh, I guess you have a supply of local maltsters. I know there's a lot of craft maltsters popping up now. Yep. Yep. So Hudson Valley malt, uh, they're in Germantown. Um, and they're, they've been amazing to work with. Dennis and Jeanette have been awesome. They make great malt and, um, They've made me everything I've asked for. <laughs> um, and yeah, they've, they've been awesome to work with. Great. Um, well, what are some of the other styles you ventured into? You mentioned the four flagship ones, but I, I assume you're making a number of other beers as well. Yeah. Well, and then, so those were the four beers that we were planning on opening as, as our flagships. Uh, and then it was actually our town's, I'm trying to remember the actual term for it, but whatever the long word is for 150th anniversary. Um, was it sesquicentennial something like that Centennial, yes i think that's correct um and so it was it was their uh their 150th birthday so we uh decided to try and make a um made a vienna style lager uh for them um the the 
the name of the town is Tivoli, which uh, backwards is I love it. Um, so we made the I love it lager. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was supposed to be a one off and has gone over so well, we have not stopped making it. So what, what, um, what, uh, what style of lager is that? So it's a Vienna style lager with some flaked corn. So more of, you know, Mexican Vienna style lager. Huh. Um, but it's that one has just gone over so well. Uh, with you know, lager, lagers have regulars. been picking up in the craft beer industry. Have you had uh, good? I mean, you, you said you had Pilsner is one of your flagships, but have you had uh, yep. good so luck Pilsner, uh, selling lagers? The Pilsner, the Vienna lager. What other lagers have we done? We, I mean, we've also done some of the hybrids. We we just put out a Kolsch uh-huh. a few weeks ago that's going really well. Um, it's definitely those are the beers that I find do best with are local regulars um the people that are looking for you know drinkable beers lawnmower beers um the end of a long day of farming kind of beer mm-hmm. um so we we've definitely been doing pretty well with 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 the lagers um yeah what else are we making well i was gonna um, mention you mentioned i think earlier the barrel age program are, are you making sours or just barrel age beers so we uh so like I said, well, we have the fooders. So last year we did um, a series of saisons that were all aged in the fooders, but they were just done straight. Um, nothing, nothing uh, sour about them. And then once we emptied them, we brewed, um, <laughs> like I said, just in order to fill fill our, t- our tap lines last year. Um, but once we had a little bit of breathing room, we then put into them um, – some beers that are souring one will be coming out for our um our first birthday in june uh we have a saison with black currants that's been aging with uh mm. brett and lacto since last summer i like black currants i'd probably enjoy that yeah, new york state black currants as well <laughs> um and then we've in the other two fooders we've got kind of um and I don't even know what you call it, but some sort of an American style sour, uh, blonde, and then a uh, my take on a uh, uh, Flanders red. Hmm. Uh, so hopefully those will be coming out soon. We've we have done a Berliner Weiss uh, as as at least to have something on tap that was even if not not sour but tart. Um, that we actually serve those at the bar with syrups as well, um, which. Unless you're a beer nerd and you don't know, you know, most people don't know much about Berliner Weisses and serving them traditionally with syrup. So that's been fun to educate people on that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of what else we made. It's been a, a <laughs> crazy year. <laughs> that's okay. Um, well, uh, where do you want to go next with the business? What are you hoping to do next? Right, I, I should ask too, are you, are you distributing or are you mainly selling through the tap room? It's mostly been through the tap room, but we've just started um, expanding our distribution. So we've been selling locally uh, pretty much if we can drive to you. We've been trying to sell to you lately. Um, but we recently signed on with a distributor down in New York City okay. uh, who's doing the five boroughs of New York and Long Island for us now. Um, and so we're really hoping to push uh, expanding our distribution and we're starting to hire a few salespeople um, and market representatives right now to really push our distribution. And then uh, uh, where are you hoping to go next uh, with the business itself? I, I, you, I think you already mentioned you're expanding your fermenters, right? Yep. So uh, like I said, we, we had f- have four 15 barrel fermenters right now. We're adding some 40 and 45 barrel fermenters. Um, and the, the, plan right now is to figure out the best way to make use of the property we're on. Um, so we just put up a big, uh, it's like a 2000 square foot tent, uh, with a bunch of picnic tables under it for the summer. Um, like I said, we just planted the barley. We, it my sounds, it sounds like brewer, you have a, have a few acres there, huh? We're on 30 acres. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my assistant brewer and uh, general manager, they just started our apiary. So we've got a, a couple of beehives going now. Oh, nice. Um, plan is next year to start planting some hops, uh, potentially some fruit trees as well, make use of the land. Um, and yeah, I just want to, I just want to keep making good beer. That's really all it comes down to. <laughs> Well, it's good. It sounds like you're successful and the business is growing. Um, 
So uh, can you tell us again your location, where you are, and uh, your website for people who want to learn a little bit more? Sure. Uh, so we're in Tivoli, New York, about halfway between um, Poughkeepsie and Albany, um, you know, right central in the, the Hudson Valley area. We're, it's actually becoming a little bit of a destination uh, within driving distance of us. There's more than a few breweries, wineries, and distilleries. Um, so it's a, a great spot to come spend some time and, and enjoy all the craft beverages in the area. And uh, yeah, our website is lastingjoybrewery.com. That's the same Lasting Joy Brewery on Instagram and Facebook. And I think my wife just started a TikTok as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, on, on all the things. Good. Good. <laughs> Um, well, Alex, are your closing thoughts after, uh, you know, 10 years in the craft beer industry and then, of course, uh, launching your own brewery just a couple of years ago? Uh, you know, all I'll say is I, I am just very excited for the future of this industry. I think we're, as an industry, um, we are taking a lot of great steps forward in terms of just making uh, some great products and we're also finally starting to i think mature as an industry in a way that's that's really fun to be a part of yeah i mean i think one thing that was good was uh you know covid was a little bit of a shakeout and Mm -hmm. uh you know it was getting a little frothy in the market maybe (laughs) Mm -hmm. so it's kind of nice to 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 maybe get people to focus a little more on uh on what's important in craft brewing so yes yeah and not just in craft brewing but in general Let's just focus on what's actually important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Alex, it's uh, been a great, great pleasure to talk with you today. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my guest today was Alex Wenner, uh, CEO and co-founder of Lasting Joy Brewery in the Hudson Valley. And uh, again, Alex, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. A big thank you to Alex Wenner for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. Beersmith is the world's most popular brewing software to support your beer brewing with advanced features used by craft breweries worldwide. Available in both the desktop and web-based format, you can build recipes from your computer, tablet, or phone. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com or give Beersmith Web a try by setting up a free account at BeersmithRecipes.com. I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. 